everybody. And since this is a, my name is Judy Dempsey, and I'm, um, I was going to say, what do I do? I'm the editor of Strategic Europe, is involved with the Carnegie, um, the Carnegie Europe Foundation, uh, working with the EU Engage project. And um, this is our first big hybrid event, and it's great to have everybody here. This is the first thing. And secondly, it's very nice to have young people here. I'm beginning to feel rather old, actually. But it's, it's very good to, to have a lot of young people here. And actually, the third thing is it's great to have two great guests and, it's, and, um, and an audience here and also making the time to come here on, on a sunny Thursday evening. And I'm also, um, I have to admit, this is my first time back in Brussels because of covid and it's also very nice to meet new staff uh, who I've never met until now. So um, we have um, a, a very difficult task ahead of us and I hope an engaging one. And it's re rethinking uh, the EU media engagement. I'm not going to go into details on this. You have the, the program on uh, through your email and so on. But we really have to have a, a discussion about whether the EU learned anything from the Arab Spring, or repeating the pre-Arab Spring, or indeed are just now becoming increasingly uh, interested or obsessed with the status quo at a time when the whole geopolitical parameters of the region are changing. So we have two guests. <laughs> uh, we have Maria Santipier, former Special Mina Advisor, the Center for Humanitarian Dialogue. Welcome, Maria, and thank you for coming. And we have, I was going to say next door, it's London. Are you in, you're based in London, yeah, because there's offices all over the world now. Emil Hokayem, Director of Regional Security and Senior Fellow for Middle East Security, International Institute for Strategic Studies in London. So welcome to you both. As a moderator, I sort of keep a strict time. Um, you have a maximum of about eight or nine minutes. If you want to talk less, fine. If you want to talk more, no. Um, what we will do, though, after you've given your presentations, I'd like to be able to pick you up on some things. And I'm a great believer in opening up the floor to the audience. You know how to raise your hand. And, and then outside in the terrestrial sphere, uh, you can actually submit your questions as well. So um, I want to get my timer. Um, and Maria, um, off you go. Thank you. Thank you, Judy. And thank you for uh, having us uh, here today. It's really, it's really like pleasant to be in Brussels and with uh, such a sunny day. So yeah, we have a very, very difficult task ahead. And having just uh, landed from uh, the Emirates to, to Brussels, I was thinking despite this uh, um, relatively, um, ge I mean, geographically, Europe and the Middle East are quite close. But I'm really struck by the fact that uh, there is really an increasing challenge from Europe to really to keep the pace of the fast-paced transformation that the MENA region is going to. So, and I think that the um, ability of Europe to be relevant uh, really depends on this ability to keep the pace at this moment. Um, so a couple of points on how the region is changing, at least how I see it, and a couple of points of how I think that the EU can actually keep the pace and maintain or keep some strategic relevance. Well, I think that, the, first of all, uh, the trends of, of transformation, we had like a glaring example with the Arab summit in Jeddah um, in this May, where uh, Assad was invited. So we can say that, yes, we are at the very end of that chapter of Arab Spring, at least the rulers of the region think that this is the case, they want that to be the case. And I think that uh, um, despite the interesting thing is that uh, despite they have still um, geopolitical difference among themselves, uh, I think that we feel when we speak to them that there is quite of an agreement that they have interest, interest in doing diplomacy among themselves and actually getting economic benefit from that diplomacy. Why? I think that because they are thinking that this will also uh, strengthen their new social contract with the society, which is going to be based basically on, I think, on, on a model we, which we have seen in the Gulf, a model um, which is, on the one hand, they give to their society a relatively stability, so relative stability and rel relative security. Um, there are open up to uh, um, uh, business opportunity for the young generation. Uh, but at the same time, there is a limited and controlled space for 
freedom of expression and political participation. So this is the mix. I'm not sure, and we are not yet in the position as a researcher to say this is going to work out across the region, but let's say that this is the thinking behind the fact of saying let's do diplomacy together, let's actually uh, have economic opportunities because we can actually, you know, have a quite stable um, regional order yet to be seen. The second trend of, um, of change, I think it's the, this idea of um, gaining um, more strategic autonomy from their usual um, um, providers of security, uh, so therefore of the West, in, in particular, and in particular the US. I think that the Ukraine war was a turning point because it really uh, provided um, uh, many of these uh, key regional players, in particular the Gulf, the ability to, um, in some way, um, uh, um, re-engage and step up engagement with other players that are not the US, so in particular China and, and Russia. And we have seen that the key moment has been the Arab-Chinese summit in in, in December, which the Saudis have host. And I think that uh, another interesting element of this uh, sort of like uh, going east towards China is that what we were saying before about more economic interaction, more interconnectivity, more diplomacy happening, well, China is strongly behind that because it, it wants to invest into the entire infrastructural projects that they actually envision for themselves. And um, um, this strategic autonomy that many of these players they want to gain and the multipolarism also that they want to play out, I think it also um, goes along with another trend, which is the fact that uh, they, um, they think that if actually they will do diplomacy among themselves, if, for example, players, regional players, which have been at odds for several years, like Saudi and Iran, finally de-escalate, that will also uh, disincentivize like security attacks to happen. So, for instance, Saudis will have less of a, and less of need of reliance on security guarantees if it actually creates the condition for um, more interconnectivity with the Iranians, potentially also persuading that it's, it will be high cost for them to engage or to make their proxy, to let them engage in attacks against, uh, against key facilities. So I think that there are all these dynamics at play and definitely, I mean, this duality of using both definitely still deterrence against your rivals, but also using diplomacy and interconnectivity to inter economic interconnectivity. Now, um, obviously, this challenge, uh, and this will be my last point on the transformation of the region, the entire sort of uh, idea that we had seen during the Trump administration of an implementation of a regional order that is driven by also the Abraham Accord, where actually the Gulf and Israel will actually have a military alliance against Iran. I think that what will be very interesting to see is how the relation with Israel actually develops. Because I think that, uh, and it will be particularly difficult with this government, but I think that the Abraham Accord, they have actually a future, but not in the way that Trump and then later Biden have thought about it. I think that they have a future as, a, again, a diplomatic avenues for Israel to integrate itself if it, if it wants to. But obviously that comes also at having or showing some strides on their own Palest on, on the Palestinian issue. So not the Abraham Accord no longer is a military alliance that polarizes the region, but the Abraham Accord as a diplomatic tool for greater integration of Israel also in the region, but this is like yet to be uh, to be to be seen if this will be implementable. Uh, but yeah, there is this mood of basically let's do both diplomacy. But let's do diplomacy now. Let's come to Europe, and I think this is the hardest part because uh, while there is all this vibrancy in the region, at the same time I feel that uh, Europe is totally out of sync of all these developments that are happening. So I think that, first of all, I will just uh, um, uh, mention three points that I think are quite problematic. The first one is that um, there is um, a need for Europe to clarify its strategic position vis-a-vis -vis the region, uh, in the sense that when you speak to interlocutors, especially in the Gulf, they ask you, but, I mean, how does Europe actually, uh, what is the role of Europe in our strategic equation? where Europe fits in all this new diplomatic and economic fl uh, flurry. I mean, where does it sit? How does Europe wants to deal with China? 
we know how does it want to deal with Russia, but how does it want to deal with China? And I think that there is an unclarity when you speak to the different capitals about this, that um, I think it's a very important point that um, uh, both, uh, um, I mean, specifically member states, key member states of the EU and Brussels, they need to have a strategic discussion about these, changing, these changes that are happening in the region and how they can actually take a clear strategic position vis-a-vis -vis of these changes that are happening whether it's uh, uh, by uh, supporting the, the process of diplomatic integration, whether it's by supporting also the process of trying to keep uh, US-China competition at the minimum level without having escalating because it benefits both the Arab states and Europe. Let's see, but I think that that discussion is not yet happening between EU member states and, and Brussels. And, uh, um, and I think that the strategies that uh, the, uh, the Council has approved, honestly, um, they lay out the common denominators of the EU in the Gulf, of the EU towards this, but they are, if we keep as Europeans at this level, the bar that low, we will not give the message of where we want to be in this new Middle East and in this new global scene that is happening. So we really need to have a strategic discussion about this. Second point, um, I think we need to also, as Europeans, think where is our added value in this new setting. I mean, regional actors are doing the escalation on their own. The Chinese have actually struck the Iran-Saudi deal. So this idea that Europe de-escalates, this idea that Europe mediates, well, I think that we need to rethink it. Maybe we can do it in partnership with member, with the, with with countries in the region, but I think that especially because of it, we have a very strong position on the on Russia, we no longer can posture ourselves just as a neutral players as we did back in the days. And third, I will say, uh, which is the most I think difficult part, we need to be able to rethink our vocabulary of diplomacy. For so long, um, and this, I mean, with the European uh, Diplomatic Academy, there is a work that is ongoing. I think we need to shift from the words we need to advise the MENA states to words like we need to listen to EU MENA states. From words we need to support EU MENA states to words like we need to partner with them. So we really need to go to a level where our diplomacy with the MENA states, especially the key Gulf states that are now gaining such a strategic importance, it needs to be much more equalitarian taking into account the role that they're taking into this multipolar world and into the great, great power competition. That will be not, if we fail at this, I think, I mean, the, the fact that we either fail or we succeed at this, I think uh, there is much at stake because it's not only the strategic weight of Europe in MENA region, but also it's our credibility towards the global South. And also it's our ability or non-ability to continue to have a coherent foreign policy so I think that the MANA is really a ground where we have to test all this. Thank you. <laughs> yes. You, you, you know, you, it, it was perfect. Thank you very much, uh, Maria. I mean, you've packed so much in. And just listening to you, um, the, the EU has failed so miserably in the connectivity issue, on the integration issue, on the regional issue, on so many issues. And I wonder if the MENA countries can do with China as well. That raises big stakes for, for Europe. So, Emil. Um, so, let me first address the, the geopolitical piece. Um, and I suspect you will see differences with, uh, with my dear friend Maria. Sorry, don't, don't throw anything at me. Um, yes, there is the escalation in the region, and that's welcome. It's better that uh, there is no violence and no insults uh, being thrown left and right than uh, it's, you know, the, it's, it's a relatively better moment. Well, I will argue that this de-escalation is sin, it's unstructured, it's disorganized, it's competitive. Um, I don't think that the way it's playing out is necessarily leads to a, a, a calmer region. I don't want to use the word architecture, but I'm going to use it anyway. But, uh, you know, it doesn't necessarily lead to a security architecture. It doesn't lead to uh, what we think uh, is something sustainable and that can weather uh, you know, what's the, the, the global shocks that we're seeing. Um, the current de-escalation 
is the product of fatigue. Uh, the players in the region have understood that they're all like heavyweights and they can box each other as much as they want. No one is going to KO the other one, right? You're not going to have total victory. So, yes, their countries are no longer pursuing maximalist uh, ambitions. They are uh, uh, um, uh, defining down what is good enough for them in, in, in the short term. The second point is, you know, the cost of the past you know, 10 years, and I'll get to this in a second. The cost of COVID, uh, the, the, you know, higher, you know, uh, food prices, uh, higher energy prices for the, you know, resource poor countries in the region and so on, have actually had a massive impact on the economic well-being in the region. Actually, we're talking about mostly about the Gulf states. Everyone else in the region is worse off. Everyone else, right? Those, those things that, you know, led to the 2011 explosion, it's not just that they exist they are 10 times more potent. It doesn't necessarily mean that they will explode a second time. I'm not making prediction about, you know, a, a second round of uprisings and stuff. So we should not be complacent about it. Yes, things are particularly good in the Gulf right now, right? Well, we'll see, you know, $75 uh, per barrel of oil is, you know, the, the, you know, the Saudis and others are starting to feel uh, the heat, so hence, you know, recent decision. But elsewhere, things are tough. And the point here is that Yes, there is a transformation. There is a prioritization of the transformation prosperity agenda in Saudi, in the UAE. And yes, because they were so involved in the region, if they backtrack or they change uh, uh, how they do things, they pursue influence, right? it will have a practical effect. On that. My point is that we don't see this necessarily translating in greater stability elsewhere. What is the country that worries us? All, right. This is a country where one would have hoped that you know, strong uh, Saudi, strong uh, Emirati, and strong Egyptian influence would you know, perhaps sadly not lead to a democratic civilian government, but at least keep things in check. And what do we realize? That we may have another massive crisis in, in, in the making, right? So what I'm trying to say is, yes, the region is, uh, 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 or countries in the region are, are aware of the global changes. And the, the ambitious, uh, ambitious ones among them, they know that the unipolar moment is behind. They don't want a, a uh, bipolar world. They don't want to be stuck between the US and China because it's, they will have to make decisions you know, in the medium and long term that they don't want to make. They want to benefit from both. So they want a multipolar world, and they want to be the poles, I mean, among the poles of this multipolar world. They want to shape, they, they want to benefit, but they also want to shape the world that's emerging. This is why you see them so uh, ambitious and assertive and aggressive and wanting to be, to organize COP and to, you know, be the Gulf, uh, on the Gulf League and, and all. They want to embed themselves globally to shape what this new world, uh, you know, as. Now, all this being said, the, the geopolitics uh, bit, the regional, what drove the, the last 10, 15 years of geopolitical competition is still around. You know, no, no one in the region, including those who have signed agreements with the Iranians, saying that Iran will no longer send weapons to militias, will stop developing UAVs and missiles, will somehow slow or stop its uh, nuclear program. This thing has not been solved. No one thinks that Saudi Arabia is going to say, oh, we believe what the Iranians are saying. Let's drop our ambitions to be a military power, to get ballistic missiles, to build our own deterrents, and so on. No one believes that UAE commercial mercantilistic interests have stopped. No one believes that you know, Egypt, uh, the, with its very significant domestic economic problems and so on, will stop caring about its neighborhood, what happens in Libya, what happens in Sudan, what happens next door in Gaza, and so on. They're all just tired, and they're trying to, you know, enjoy that quiet moment. But we, I don't see a track that solves any of this. I don't think that, the, you know, a few years ago, we we're talking about how, you know, the Gulf states and Iraq can get to a better relationship. I don't think it's in the making. I think the Gulf states have essentially said, you know what, nothing works in Iraq. Uh, if, other, if we collectively want to believe that uh, the Sudanese government and, you know, is, is a consensual one that is, I mean, you know, you're the Iraq specialist, please let me know. There is a lot of cynicism about each one. I would say, like, on Syria, for instance, yes, uh, uh, Syria is back in the Arab League, and we can discuss if it's good or bad, or whatever. 
but the reason why Arab countries, you know, in, uh, uh, invited Syria back or welcomed it or whatever, it's not, it's not because of Syria itself. It's really to quiet things down and particularly in terms of Saudi Arabia to demonstrate its leadership. There's, there is no substantive Saudi policy on Syria, but there was a Saudi moment where, you know, we can do something that the Americans and the Europeans and others don't like and, 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 and others in the Arab world are skeptical about. We decided it's there. It doesn't mean, and I don't think that we're going to see a stabilization of Syria because, you know, the Saudis and the Emiratis have decided that, uh, you know, uh, to turn that page. What they've made is a decision to draw a line under a decade of, uh, of unrest in, in the region. But I don't see them necessarily involved in, in like the hard diplomatic work because that's not the point. The point for a number of Gulf states is that they look at the rest of the region as entanglements, legacy relationships that cost a lot. Uh, those Lebanon and, and Yemen and Iraq and Syria are countries that cannot be fixed. Uh, that you just want to neutralize them. You just don't want to face the externalities of these conflicts to focus on yourself and build your global standing. Now, when it comes to the, the, the EU, I, I can't do a better job than, than Maria here, but let me just put where the EU is a bit in, in perspective. I would argue that the EU was at its apex, in, at least in the Mediterranean the region, in the 2000s, where like the project looked amazing and it was expanding and uh, and you had the institutions that looks, you know, you, the, the euro came and, and that was a big market and so on. What we saw in the 2000s was the EU focusing on, on partnerships, right? We want to find TCAs here left and right and so on. Um, you tell me how this part partnership went, uh, we can score them. Or I can give you my sense of the one I studied, the one with Syria. When the EU decided to put, go full steam on the TCA with Syria, um, that's 2007, 8, 9 and so on. Uh, the Syrians pushed back a number of those things, but what are the two clauses that the EU um, compromised the most about? The Human Rights Clause and the WMD Clause. What happened two years later? You tell me. My point is that sometimes the EU wants those partnerships more. They want to institutionalize the relationship. They see the partnerships as a way to address those issues from a technocratic perspective and offer goodies and, and so on and so on without talking about the hard issues. In the 2010s, what did the EU do? The EU had to focus on the externality of Middle East instability, primarily refugees, migration, and terrorism, and, and you know, the geopolitical competition. And the EU was pretty much reactive. It wasn't able to come up with, an, like, was the EU, wanted the EU, um, uh, intervene in Syria or not intervene in Syria. Some EU member states wanted to do that. Uh, most of them were saying, okay, we, we, we're not, we don't know, you figure it out and so on, right? Libya was the one moment of, uh, of uh, 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 cohesion, unity, if anything, it played against. Uh, but essentially, the EU showed us in the previous decade that it doesn't know how to speak the language of power. And, and, and I don't think they solved it. Now in this decade, what do you have? You have a return of autocratic rule. Um, you know, we, I mean, I think uh, Tunisia is the, the biggest example uh, of that. We all know, or we all suspect that it's going to be extremely difficult to, to, to get any reforms there, to uh, moderate the behavior of, uh, of the president, uh, get something on and so on. But we're still going to throw a lot of uh, uh, money at the problem because what are we worried about? Collapse in Tunisia, that then export, uh, you know, if we can't figure out Tunisia, how do we discuss Egypt, which is 10 times bigger, right? I mean, if we can't figure out policy towards a country that, does, that is not a military power and so on, how do we? Um... So now we have to, at the same time as you have what you described, which is figuring out where the EU sits in this changing environment, but also the emergence of global a big power competition in that space, right? The EU now enjoys this moment of cohesion and coherence because of the threats from the East. It is the threats from the South that is still around, and I don't want to sound like a but you know, it's still around, and it has, and we've seen in the previous decade, 
has an impact on European politics and security, a direct one. And at, that moment, at the moment, we don't see much thinking about that. I can't fault just the EU, by the way. I mean, it's not as if the others, the Americans and things, have a sense of that. So, and a very complicated space. I'll stop here. Uh, thank you, Emil. Um, thank you, Maria. Uh, you both uh, packed an awful lot into this. Um, I have a question to both of you. Um, I'm very interested in the element of fatigue. I mean, it was fatigue and the cul-de-sac that actually spurred on the, the peace accord, the, in the Good Friday Agreement in Northern Ireland. Fatigue is, can be the catalyst actually for, for change. But what's interesting, both of you raise, but don't explore, is that if you have this kind of um, element of diplomacy and these countries, whether it's Saudi Arabia, Iran, or anything, how does this play into, into security? I mean, this surely matters, given the whole architect of, of conflicts in the region. You mentioned Sudan, heaven knows what's going to happen in Egypt, you have Tunisia, Iraq unfinished. There's so much unfinished business. There's so much insecurity. Do you see security becoming a building block in this rapprochement? Maria, would you? Uh, yeah, I mean, uh, I think, um, I mean, I'm glad that Emil gave the other, like, uh, uh, half of the apple in the sense that it's so true that this is an, uh, it's not an order. This is an unfinished <laughs> business and we don't know how it is going to end up. And to answer your question, um, it's, uh, uh, there is definitely a, um, uh, I mean, I don't think that security is the building block of this order. It's actually the one thing that, that the, all these players know. Maybe they can achieve a point where, as I was saying before, they can create the, the um, high cost for actually returning to a fight against each other. This is why we don't see, for example, uh, Houthis uh, um, or, I mean, the, the, in Yemen, we have seen that uh, even if that there was a, a ceasefire, even if it wasn't renewed, but there hasn't been major attacks of Houthis on Saudi installation. The same thing we see in Iraq, where the popular mobilization units so and other uh, non-state actors associated, associated to the Iranians, they don't actually proactively uh, launch attacks against uh, uh, Saudis or other facilities. So I think that the security is that, like, uh, is sort of not solving, but at least reaching the point where at least there is some red lines. Um, but I'm not sure they will hold because, uh, you know, the non-state actors, they also have their own interest. So it's not, again, a, a situation where it's the Iranian who tell them, don't do that. Maybe now, it's uh, the, in some cases, they agree that this red line, they have interest in, in keeping it. But uh, I don't think that we can put our hand on fire and say that this will hold forever. It's not, again, a, a Helsinki process. It's not a, a process where you have a security agreement among states like the West at some point thought and wished to be. Actually, this building block, I think, is infrastructure, is economy. And this is why where the EU enterprises come in in all this. Maybe, maybe, maybe you're too fixated on the conventional definition of security, because uh, economy, prosperity, stability is a measure of security. But when you mentioned, uh, you mentioned it, uh, Maria, and maybe Emil can pick this up, this connectivity and this integration, is this seriously for real? Are you serious about it? You're asking the wrong person. I work at Double Life. Double Life. We count tanks and bullets and things. But anyway, I'll try to uh, I'll, I'll try to to answer uh, that one. I, I'm kidding. There is a, a connectivity agenda in the region. Uh, that's for sure. There are lots of desires. You will hear uh, um, the Jordanians talk about how they need water and energy and how they want to be, you know, helping to connect Egypt with uh, Iraq and uh, and Egypt with Lebanon and and so. On. I mean, uh, and then there you have real big projects on right now, like Egypt, the interconnector where electricity with Greece. And so, I mean, you have some of these big things. You know, Egypt could be an energy powerhouse. Uh, you know, they have they have the space, they have the, uh, they can do wind, they can do solar, they can do quite a lot. So there is a lot of those discussions, right? But the problem is that it's for us to get infatuated in that and thinking that somehow addresses everything else that's happening, right? I mean, uh, you can invest in a large scale like plant and put pipes and so on. 
what does it do to create basic jobs? What does it do to deal with uh, 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 food uh, uh, security? What does it? And this is this is the disconnect. We can all think about those big multi-billion uh, uh, euro projects uh, to to be funded that will attract elites and could actually calm things down for something. The question is, does it does it reach? Do the benefits go down a thing? And then you know the the the, the thing with uh, you know Maria was talking about non-state actors. Yes, it's good that they're not firing stuff at their neighbors and so on, but when they're not firing that stuff, it's not that they are actually behaving nicely. They are, the, or doing yoga. They, they, are, they are actually consolidating their power in those geographies. So now, yes, it's good that the Hussis are not lobbying stuff at Saudi. It also means that the Hussis are consolidating their power inside Yemen, at the extent of others, and could, in the, in the future, will emerge as a stronger force. Uh, same thing with the PMF in, in Iraq. Same thing with Hezbollah in Lebanon. We've seen. So, when, when you don't have active fighting, it doesn't mean that these actors are thinking, oh, let's, let's figure out how to be uh, uh, nice to the wider society and so on. So they continue having their agenda. And I, I will say, like, you know, Iran itself is, is showing us that you know, they can talk to the Saudis and create those illusions of the escalation and so on and continue doing what they've been doing in the past. There is no way at the moment to measure Iranian compliance with whatever they promised the the Saudis and um, and and the uh, uh, and the Chinese, um, so that's an aspect. And then on the conventional side, we don't still don't have a, a, a an agreement in the region to talk about. Okay, uh, uh, you know, missile reach. I mean, you know, are we applying MPCR or should we limit the testing of the? Th this is not a conversation that's happening. So you still have a conventional buildup that is happening as we speak. Yes, I mean, I mean, this brings in so many dimensions. You know, if Europe really is behind the curve, the role of the Abraham Accords, um, the whole question of WMD and how America is going to re-enter into the into the accord with Iran. Um, please, um, I'd like to open this up to the discussion. And anybody out there, if you want to send in questions, there's a there's a chat system, a messaging system, or whatever they call it. But um, if you want to ask a question, keep it, keep it one question at a time. Identify yourselves and say, uh, let us know who you want the, uh, the question directed to. So you were first. Uh, and number two, we take three questions at a time. One, two. Uh, I'm Emil Badevrin, a research fellow at the College of Europe in Nottlin. Um, thank you for this uh, talk. I just have a comment, not a question, because okay. I'm myself from the region. Um, first of all, I would like to comment on the Abraham Accord, and you said that's a kind of an outfit for integrating Israel in the region, right? This is not the case, because Abraham Accord are signed with dictators and not with the people. It's the same thing with the, um, the uh, Camp David Accords, the same thing with the Jordanians, the same thing with the PLO ones. There is no integration whatsoever, plus Israel does not want to be integrated in the region itself. There's ideological questions here. The other question here um, that troubles me, uh, okay. I have one comment late. No, it's only fair. Next, next one. Yes, please. I'll come back to you again. The lady there, please. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I'm Lavinia. I work in International Crisis Group here in Brussels. Uh, my question is for both. Um, what is your opinion on the appointment of the new EU Special Envoy for the Gulf? And uh, if you have any advice for him? So, and uh, do we have a third question? Yes, please. Thank you, uh, Angel Saf, a professor of strategy at the Southern Business School, a member of the Engage Project, uh, together with Carnegie and many others here. Um, thank you very much. It was a great conversation so far. So m my question has to do with um, how useful is the MENA, MENA as a region and as a category? Uh, in particular, I thought the first, uh, Maria's uh, description was great, and also the second. Uh, and also it means, but Maria seemed to be talking more about the Middle East, while on the other hand, uh, the Northern, N North Africa seems to have be a, quite a different picture right now. So that's my question. And um, the Abraham Accords, which is very important, I mean, 
and you wonder you know what the americans really wanted from this and how you build on it then the second one um the eu um the the MENA region and the third one was um um, um uh, yeah yeah so please whoever wants to uh, so on the abraham accord um so first of all just to clarify i am uh, what i was suggesting is that the formula that was thought of the Abraham Accord in the Trump days when the UAE and others signed the, the accord. I don't think that is any longer viable in this. Huh? No, of this idea. No, I'm, I'm just saying that the idea that there is like, for example, a military alliance uh, that the, the Abraham Accord creates a greater Gulf uh, um, uh, Israel interaction, but that also has a security implication. So I, I'm, I'm just sorry, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you let me speak, because it doesn't seem that you are open actually to have this conversation. What I wanted to say is that geopolitical point is not a political point. If I would be an advisor to the Israelis, I would tell them actually in this moment, it would be the most smart things to do if you could, is to actually scale down on your ambition to actually turn the Abraham Accord into a military alliance and actually rethink it as a tool for diplomatic integration. That, that comes, as I said, at the cost of you making some process, some strides in the, in, in, the, in the peace process, which this government doesn't seem to be able to do. This is the first thing. The second thing, I think it's becoming increasingly, and this is the point I'm just coming from Dubai and from Abu Dhabi to say that, I mean, really, the, it's, it's increasingly embarrassing, I think, for countries that have signed these accords to sustain it with this Israeli government. So I'm just saying that this, um, the, that this uh, the approach that was put forward back in the days when it was signed is probably no longer works. The Americans, what I think that they will try to suggest, for example, when it comes to Saudi-Israeli relation, which has been the matter of the latest Blinken visit yesterday, um, I think that there are some areas of cooperation between Saudi Arabia and Israel on technology irrigation. I think that they will try to focus on this. I don't see, and I don't think that Israelis see a normalization happening during this year. For the uh, EU envoy for the Gulf, uh, briefly, I will just be very brief. I think I think that um, uh, we go to the um, uh, to the last point that I was making: how to reformulate our, our vocabulary of diplomacy. So I think that um, the Gulf is the area, and Emil knows better than anyone else this, where um, there has been a lot of sensitivities about how the EU has worded itself. Uh, in terms of like this sense, it's always perceived with the posturing with a sense of superiority, the colonial issue that hasn't been overcome, the discussion on human rights also is often uh, misunderstood uh, or uh, taken in, uh, under the wrong angle, at least in the way that it is perceived. So again, I think that the e he is in a good position now to start to rethink the language of diplomacy in a more equalitarian term. And I think that this is a great, uh, you know, platform to test that. And just to link to the last great question that you ask, um, yeah, I mean, this is not a block. This is a, this region. I think there has been many great articles about how this definition of Middle East it's actually quite becoming quite, uh, you know, um, uh, yeah. I mean, no longer probably relevant. So I think that we should, uh, for example, the EU Gulf envoy. I think it will work a lot with the Horn of Africa envoy. You know, so we need to rethink also this. Maybe we will have in one year an event which is just about uh, hornographic and and golf, for example. Yeah. Um, really, um, do you want to comment on any of these questions? I have got four terrific questions from outside. If I can, uh, are you sure you want to come in there? Um, just one tiny thing in my mind. Um, um, Israel never took up the Saudi offer over Jerusalem many years ago, which is great pity. And I just wonder what Israel now thinks of this rapprochement between um, Saudi and Iran. So um, I'm going to, t very quickly, thank you out there who gave the questions. What, what type of engagement ooh, can the EU envisage in the MENA region at a time where, a, when, where a EU universalist values are not very popular? That is democracy and the rule of law. Can I read out the next one? You can hold on to this. Second question, ooh, uh, we touched on this, but 
can expand. How do you judge China's engagement in the Middle East? Um, for example, mediating relations between Iran and Saudi Arabia while attacking the latter to join the BRICS bank. And uh, I think there's an Italian somewhere around here. Uh, do you believe Italian uh, PM's visit to Tunisia will help unblock the IMF funding and help reduce summer migration? I'll take two at a time. Four is a little bit too many. Emil. Uh, sure. Um, yeah, let me. Just looking for the China one first, let me, uh, let me deal with that. I, I, I mean, I was just in, in Singapore where the Chinese defense minister was there. So I was actually able to ask him publicly, privately as well, but publicly, you know, okay, you facilitated that deal. Do you take responsibility for its implementation? Uh, and the answer uh, that was short was essentially no. It was vague, but the point is. And that's essentially, you know, what China, uh, how China wants to operate in the region. It actually expects compliance uh, with the deal because it expects those countries to value the relationship with, with China so much that they will behave. But there is no, you know, it's not that China will monitor and enforce, uh, you know, the deal. That it will look at what the Iranians are doing and say, oh, oh we don't like that. Or we, you know, uh, will intercept some shipment there. Or we will call the, the Saudi for a statement on Iran that, you know, is, is out of place. I think that this is not at all how China wants to uh, to operate in the region. Uh, it, uh, first, it wants to cultivate the illusion that it's really big and powerful. That that is currency, that's diplomatic currency, and it wants to focus on its uh, uh, you know connectivity uh, uh, projects, on its advancing its economic influence, and and, and so on. It is not uh, um, you know they're interested in we we have. A big project I completed some some years, but you know it's digital presence in the region and so on. So it's, it's there's quite concrete things that China wants, uh, but we don't see them as uh, you know wanting to take on a strict security role. Let me say, and actually it was quite telling if you look at the the agreements that was negotiated between uh, um, the Saudis and the Iranians. Uh, there is one that reiterates the principle of non-interference in each other's affairs. Okay, that's a very general point. And then they bring back the 1998 and 2001 uh, agreements. Remember the music of 1998 to 2001? I mean, it's like 20-plus years. They're going back that long. Much better music than now. But the point is that the Chinese did not, you know, there was nothing fresh in it. It wasn't about the substance. It was about we are China, the big power. You know, we're not going to negotiate the details of your relationship. You know, go in your drawers and pick up something you have agreed on in the past. Let's revive this. But it is our sheer prestige that. Uh, now, the, the key question for me is, I mean, China is central today to uh, Saudi Arabia's transformation project and to Iran's economic future, given, you know, sanctions and, and decoupling and what the impact of Ukraine and so on. You know, can China actually invest as much time and, and capital and thing on in those two countries? Does it have to differentiate? Will it? Will there be actually competition because one country gets what is denied to another one, or one country, you know, has you know greater infrastructure and whatever? So that's one uh, one uh, important point. Uh, just on the kind of um, on the question on engagement, uh, just quickly, I I think it's harder and harder to have uh, um, to talk about values. Um, and I think one of the problems in how the EU and Western countries reacted when Russia invaded Ukraine was to catch it as like democracy versus autocracy kind of thing. I understand why we're doing it, and I think it's a valid argument. But talking to other countries, you know, it, you know bringing it back to you know, international law and sovereignty and Article 51 and whatever makes a lot more sense than calling that, like, you know, the titanic battle of our age uh, between between uh, democracy and autocracy. And I, I think the uh, leaders in the region are comfortable with their autocratic ways at this point. They think they won the big challenge. Those, those, ten, those 10 years are over. This chapter is over. Uh, don't come and scold us again. So I wouldn't lead with that, not because I don't care about it, but because if you do that, you interrupt the engagement way too early. And, and there will be opportunities in the future. Can I just add on, on this? 
because this issue of the values, it's always, I mean, when you go to one of the countries in the, in the region, either as an analyst or even I think diplomats, they, they find out the same situation, say, please, let's not start by speaking about human rights. And they have become, a, while it's so important to speak about human rights and values, but the fact that maybe we have uh, like, uh, discuss it in an unstrategic way, it has backfired on, on even advances on this, on, on, on this theme. So um, again, going back on how to rethink our diplomacy, I think it's still, first of all, it's important not to put it pro probably as the first topic, just in a matter of like being strategic, but at the same time, it's still very important to engage on this, but in a different way. Let's think about other fora on which we can discuss this, for instance, uh, if we discuss about the rights of migrant works, the rights of LGBTQ community, the rights of women, uh, death penalty, um, I mean, I think that there is great interest of country, among countries within the region to discuss it also among themselves because they face actually social pressure in, I mean, of young generation that are actually asking this question, how do we place ourselves? Then there are like certain issues that can be addressed maybe more in the praxis rather than the codification like when it comes to certain like LGBTQ rights, at least this is what uh, when we go to the Middle East and especially in the Gulf, they, 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 they say. So again, there are ways in which we can be more strategic about how to make advances in human rights without, I think, um, seemingly like portraying ourselves as those ones who are the example, because I think we are by far not the example. I mean, we are societies ourselves, our European societies are a society in crisis, and we have to admit that as well. We're going to get around a, 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 another round of questions in just minute, one minute. Um, um, this values and well, it's the fatigue as well. Was it the fourth question was how do we keep? Why do we keep omitting Saudi Arabia's eight years and still ongoing war in Yemen and still engage with it? Actually, it's about it's about European powerlessness, and we've crossed our own red lines in some ways as well. But now that we have this. Um, we're on between uh, uh, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Maybe, as you said, um, the, the conflict may be reduced, but I, I, it's very hard to judge. I, I think, I think, you know, European uh, uh, views on Yemen were not primarily driven by Yemen or an understanding of that. It was, you know, just hitting on Saudi, for good or bad, and and the Saudis. Not that I agree with the war or thing, but the Saudis have been trying to get out of it for some time. The, the problem was, you know, how to, and, and, and they were not competent uh, diplomatically or militarily to figure out an exit. And actually, the way it's ending is, in a way, the, the worst possible scenario, where you have an ascendant uh, 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 Husi movement, uh, you have Iran that is quite entrenched, and, and, and so on. But it's not as if the, 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 the Saudis were completely, I mean, we portray their position in Yemen as maximalist on the political side. I don't see it as maximalist at all. Uh, I, I'm not defending at all the prosecution of the war, but if you look at their objectives even before, they're nowhere. They, they don't compare, for instance, to Iran's objective in Syria, where we're going to crush all opposition. They're all jihadis. Uh, we want a centralized state. We're not going to provide a, a dollar for reconstruction and so on. For the Saudis in, in Yemen, from the beginning, they, the statements from the beginning were the Hussis have to be part of the solution. Uh, we perhaps will consider a decentralized or, fe uh, or, or uh, um, federal thing. Uh, we will provide money and so on. It's just how the Saudis did it, which showed that they don't know how to, to do Not that others do. But fundamentally, I will say one thing. All large countries or powerful countries will have a very hard time accepting an armed non-state actor next door with advanced capability. Turkey doesn't do that with the PKK. Uh, Israel doesn't do that with Hezbollah. You know, what the, what, uh, 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 what the Saudis have done is, you know, like, and again, I'm not endorsing that, but it's like normal behavior, right? It, it leads to very bad outcomes, but it's like how you, a state sees itself vis-a-vis -a, -vis a non-state actor that it cannot deter on the other side. This is really interesting because of what Maria was saying we don't even have the language of, dip of different diplomacy to deal with this different mindset. And in some ways, the Europeans are not good at complexity. Um, we have a question here and a question through the, the yes. other hybrids. In Thank you very much. It's Balashi Meshi from Lucy Europe. 
And my question is uh, following up on Emi's comment on the, the Russia Ukraine, uh, Russian aggression against Ukraine, and how many countries see uh, the Russian aggression, and specifically on the question of sanctions. How do you think, uh, speaking of EU, we have an point on sanctions as well. Do you think he, he could be successful in convincing some of the countries, such as the UAE, which, where we have seen sanctions circumvention happening to close those loopholes? Okay. Uh, great, great, great question. And I'll, I'll tag this on with the, the second question. Uh, what can the West do then to build our, our economic self-power in the region? It might, help to, uh, it might help us counter Chinese influence. So I think the Russia-Ukraine thing is very important because it just shows the distortion of our, of our values and definition of, of how to deal with authoritarian regimes. Um, Russia-Ukraine, please. I suspect this, uh, this envoy is going to spend a lot of time in, in Ankara, in, uh, in Israel, and in the UAE, which are the three main uh, you know, recipients of, of that, that money. Um, look, they're not UN sanctions. So they will always have this answer saying, you know, this is not international law. So you have to make a, a convincing case and you're not going to apply secondary sanctions because we're, these are three significant economies that are quite embedded and, you know, uh, connected to Western economies and so on. So I, 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 it will be easier to, or for that envoy, I suspect, to make specific cases against specific behaviors, you know, bank licenses or specific individuals and so on then expect some like blanket uh, uh, um, abidance by by uh, you know eu and, and us law and to be honest it's it's very weird i mean the eu uh, is not very good at at that game I and mean, it came quite late uh, the coercion game the sanctions I and mean, we know how uh, it struggled uh, you know a decade ago and uh, and, and so on so I'm not even sure, and I don't know, I mean, I'm speaking out of ignorance here, but I suspect that the EU itself has a, a problem discussing that. I mean, within the EU, you have issues, you have and so on. So, so I, I think it's going to be an uncomfortable uh, uh, one. Like, isn't it that uh, uh, I, um, despite their like their hosting uh, Russian oligarchs and all these, I mean some of these, isn't isn't it that the like, both the leadership and also the people like the, they are more sympathetic to the Ukrainian situation? I mean to the situation the Ukrainians are they are in, and they I mean in private conversation they recognize where the where right and wrong stand. I mean, what I'm trying to say is that I think that also another strategic mistake that has been done is trying to turn the arm of this country and say, you really have to take a staunch stand against Russia. Maybe it would be more conducive to say, continue to support the humanitarian like uh, assistance to Ukraine, continue to be friend and supportive of Ukraine, because they, the other thing they won't do. And I think that what we may help also the enforcement of this, of, of, or may persuade some of these countries to actually implement the sanction is the active, effective diplomacy with the Gulf. So again, we go back to the synergies between the EU Gulf, the EU envoys, and how important it is. To me, the EU envoys, they are helpful in this moment because they need to shuttle between the capitals and this key region and among themselves. If that dynamic is in place, we can, we can, we can, clarify our strategic stand we can try at least i said no not yet. we are not oh no, that's very interesting but uh, yeah. but he's uh, the person who asked this question it's also it's also this it's a double standards uh, labeling uh, the war in ukraine autocracy versus yeah. democracy and what do we have in the middle east then i mean we have authoritarian regimes yeah. and no human rights and what about the younger generation saying hey europe you're supporting ukraine what about us so, I mean, we're using one language for the Russia-Ukraine war and uh, a language devoid of any content for a younger generation who do want to perform in the Middle East. It, the, the bottom line is uh, the EU is back to the pre-Arab Spring supporting yeah. the status quo. Okay. I, I, the whole discussion about double standards as well is not one I'm very comfortable with because Every country is going to yes. be inconsistent. Yes. I mean, you know, we, we, we yes. have this consistency test that we, we pass. And, and of course, it's a function of history. And it's a function. I mean, you know, Arab states have nothing to say about the Uyghurs in China, 
right? I mean, they will yeah. they will talk about yeah. you know the, the double Indeed. standards elsewhere, Indeed. but we also have you know our blind spots Indeed. on on the Rohingyas or on yeah. the things. And so I mean, and, and no one is really talking about that yeah. the double standard. What I'm trying to say is, yeah. is if you make it purely about values, yeah, yes, you will. You can identify the inconsistency here. And okay, there. and obviously. It is always a mix of the two, okay. and I don't think that uh, you know those in, in the Gulf who are strategically sympathetic to Russia or they have something as they are, you know, not human beings who don't see the suffering of the Ukrainians. Yeah. They just think that, yeah. on balance, it's better not to alienate the Russians to get something out of the, the, the this whole thing. It's it's a very it's it's a cynical uh, but understandable view. The question is, can we do something about it? And the problem is, uh, I, I don't, I don't think we've developed the, the language, and we're dealing with twenty years yeah. of essentially failure, Western failure in the region. Yeah, well, you, you remember the, the so-called quartet in the Middle East. I mean, that was uh, let's talk about this. And um, we're, we're going to wrap up in in, in two three minutes. So, um, let's turn it around, and you've described what the interests are of the MENA region. But what are the interests of the European Union towards MENA then? We have the migration issue, we have the climate issue and so on. But do we have, do you have shared common interests within the EU to deal with MENA? Or we're just plodding along and reactive? Just think of Tunisia, for instance. Have we learned really nothing from the Arab Spring and now the collapse of what was um, the great white hope in Tunisia? I think uh, Judy, the, the answer to your question is not about the themes, but it's about, again, an internal EU issue about member states and Brussels, this eternal issue now about, about this. But I think that, that uh, um, this is why I spoke a lot about the Gulf, because I think it's an area over there where really the, it's a very, very important to like clarify where we stand on a couple of things. And this is why it's important to engage the key EU capitals on, on this discussion and not to have them to just do bilaterals on their own. But uh, we know what are the common, like uh, common, uh, common. I think that on the one hand, there is the strategic discussion again, that needs to happen between capitals, key capitals of EU member states and Brussels. On the other hand, there is uh, like this idea of the common denominators on topics that are very important for the EU, the energy transition. But again, how to work, and, and let's say even the human rights, but how to work it, and even the role of economic of, of companies in the region, how Europe economically can, if this economic interconnectivity really develops, can fit into this. You know, so there are these shared interests, but I think that before even we go into there, and or while we are going into there, while we are developing the language on how to speak about the, the energy transition, blah, 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 we also need to have first this EU member states, Brussels, more clear. The, the strategic um, documents that we produce at the Council, they're not enough. They are seen as list of, a list of uh, like shopping lists or like whatever, like a list of points. And, and they are not like projecting the strategic vision of Europe. Yeah. You need Berlin, Paris, Rome, whatever, like all these capitals to actually have, on the contrary, to face that this is a changing region and say, okay, our priorities, shared priorities, one, two, three, at the level of the executive, I think. You have a minute. I'll just say two things. Um, first, it's a mindset issue. Like, we should not be complacent. And I think that's my, my big concern. CC has not, you know, uh, is not going to solve Egypt for us. Faisal is not going to solve Libya. Uh, Assad has very little to offer and so on. It doesn't mean that we can do something fundamental about that at this point. It's not, you know, one should not have those, you know, massive ambitious dreams about how, you know, that era is, is, is over when, you know, we would talk about you know, how to support civil society in massive terms. I, I, th I think we have to be, more, but we shouldn't be complacent. We shouldn't lie to ourselves about what they uh, have offered. The second one is uh, invest a lot more in contingency planning. We we cannot, you know, we were surprised at, oh, you know, uprisings or, uh, or you know, war in this country or, or refugees and so on. I mean, we should stop being surprised. We should actually expect, yeah. you know, our systems are going to be stress tested. Yeah, like yeah, exactly. I mean, Just that's, so another, one. that's <laughs> another one because everyone yeah. thought this was a trajectory. They're going to hate each other forever. They wouldn't see that moment was what I would still qualify as a tactical agreement 
but exist that transforms you know what others can do in that space i'm very impressed with the fact you can uh, keep to the time uh, our time is up this conversation could have gone on for a long time and we've got so many other issues to deal with especially the rehabilitation of the site i want to thank our great speakers maria fantapier and emile hoyekan thank you for coming to brussels on this sunny day i want to thank the great audience and thank uh, the, the back room, the backstage for the Carnegie Europe Foundation hosting this, and of course, EU Engage. Nice to see colleagues from the EU Engage Consortium here. Thank you very much for your engagement to this fine evening, and you know where to go after this. <laughs> thank you very much.